Good, good morning. Oh. Dr. Dorsey, I'll do a quick introduction oh, okay. for you, and then we will hand it back over to you. Um, okay. So formally, everyone, hello. My name is Meredith Shanda. I am the Director of Clinic mm -hmm. Operations for the MAVEN Project. And again, thank you all for joining us today. And especially thank you to Duffy Health Center for hosting today's session on tick-borne diseases. Uh, for those of you who have not met Dr. Dorsky in the past, uh, Dr. David Dorsky is an adjunct associate professor of medicine at the University of Connecticut School of Medicine. And before retiring from state service, he served as tenured faculty there for 28 years in the Division of Infectious Diseases. He's been involved in teaching at all levels, including basic science research in virology and immunology and clinical practice, including inpatient consultation and longitudinal HIV outpatient practice. He went on to practice for two years with South Coast Health based in Fall River, Massachusetts, performing outpatient infectious disease consultation, outpatient management, peer review, and antibiotic stewardship. Um, we are incredibly grateful to Dr. Dorsky for taking the time today to share his expertise with us. And with that, Dr. Dorsky, I'll allow you to begin presenting. Okay. Well, um, good afternoon or morning for the West Coast. So my training and experience in ID has been in academic practice in New England. So I've had lots of exposure to uh, tick-borne diseases and personal exposure to lots of ticks. Um, Today, uh, I'll discuss a subset of tick-borne infections prevalent in New England, transmitted by black-legged deer or Ixodes ticks. Uh, I'm going to emphasize the reasoning behind the approach to clinical management. I'll try not to read all the slides verbatim. Uh, you can obtain the slide deck if you want to review anything. Also, um, I'm not going to need all the time allotted, so if someone wants to ask a question, uh, it would be, it's okay for me to be stopped, if, um, but I'm, I'll try and I'll leave plenty of time for questions as well. Um, <clears throat> I want to discuss the four most common uh, infections transmitted by deer ticks individually and how their coincidence affects the approach to management. <clears throat> there, there are many other tick-borne diseases out there that are fortunately rare. Some of them like Powassan virus infection, tularemia, and Rocky Mountain spotted fever have been reported in New England, but again, are quite rare, and I'm not gonna dwell on them at all. <clears throat> As you can see here, um, New England and the Northern Midwest catch the majority of Lyme, babesiosis, and anaplasmosis cases. About 30,000 cases of Lyme disease are reported to the CDC annually, but the CDC also estimates over 476,000 cases per year. Rocky Mountain spotted fever and ehrlichiosis occur mainly in the middle southern part of the U.S. where the vectors are more common. <clears throat> Powassan virus is transmitted by the deer tick and causes encephalitis that is often severe and sometimes fatal. There's no effective treatment yet. And fortunately, as you can see, it's quite rare, about as rare as Eastern equine encephalitis that has been reported in Massachusetts. Uh, Powassan is actually usually less lethal though. <clears throat> the main host for the deer tick is actually the white-footed mouse but the ticks feed on all sorts of mammals and require a blood meal to um, complete each stage of their life cycle. The ecology of the deer tick is quite complex, has changed over the last 50 years and may continue to change as the environment changes. <clears throat> Different stages of development are shown with the, uh, the nymph uh, is on Ike's cheek on the dime here and the adults, the male and the female, are over his ears, and the um, larva is that um, dot, brown dot over his uh, jawbone. <clears throat> because early Lyme disease is associated with a characteristic rash called erythema chronicum migrans, a clinical diagnosis may be possible by history and physical alone. Anaplasmosis and babesiosis may be identified directly on blood smear or by PCR. 
uh, for disseminated and late Lyme disease, confirmatory serology is useful. <clears throat> I want to discuss babesiosis first uh, because this is the one relatively common tick-borne infection in New England that actually can be fatal and for which the management may require hospitalization. Uh, this is a malaria-like parasite that multiplies in red blood cells uh, shown here in the slide. Looks a little bit like falciparum malaria. It causes hemolysis and may have systemic effects. Unlike malaria, there's no exoerythrocytic phase. In other words, no, no multiplication in the liver. The organisms only multiply in red blood cells. In immunocompetent hosts, <clears throat> most Babesia infections are actually asymptomatic or associated with mild flu-like symptoms and self-limited. With an intact immune system, it's usually cleared easily and may not require treatment at all. Babesiosis is prevalent throughout New England, but especially on the Cape and Islands, including Block Island. <clears throat> Babesiosis is often associated with co-infection by Lyme, Borrelia, or anaplasma. And the significance is that the treatments differ. As for malaria, high degrees of parasitosis can cause severe hemolysis that require hospitalization in order to receive exchange transfusions and complicated cases may result in fatality. About as I have here, a third of cases are hospitalized and exchange transfusions are a big production, uh, especially on an emergent basis. Um, fortunately, there are only a few fatalities per year, but that's based on really on preparedness and the availability of exchange transfusions for the critically ill. <clears throat> Asplenic individuals are the ones that are at particular risk for severe or fatal illness with babesiosis. Immunocompromised individuals, whether congenitally immunocompromised or acquired, are at risk for being unable to clear the parasitemia, even with repeated cycles of treatment. For patients with hemoglobinopathies, interestingly, the risks of babesiosis are not clearly understood and may be quite small. In the case of sickle cell anemia, babesia are not able to efficiently complete their life cycle in sickled red blood cells, resulting in reduced levels of parasitemia. This is an area that's being studied actively. I'm not aware of any cases of severe babesiosis coincident with sickle cell anemia, so I'd have to leave the subject at that. If anyone has any experience they want to share, I'd be interested in hearing it. <clears throat> there are many individuals in endemic regions with positive serology from asymptomatic infection. So retrospective diagnosis by serology is not that helpful. Furthermore, serology is not useful for diagnosing acute cases. Therefore, diagnosis relies on direct demonstration by smear or by detection by PCR. <clears throat> As you can see here, um, PCR is about 25,000 times more sensitive than direct smear. The use of this highly sensitive test makes sense if babesiosis is suspected in individuals at risk. Since the parasitosis may increase suddenly and dramatically, even though not detected on smear initially. The key point here is that there's a big difference in management for at-risk patients, where clearance of the parasite should be documented by PCR to ensure that they don't return. It can be surprising at times how difficult it is to achieve clearance in some cases. Fortunately, the treatment is usually quite well tolerated, although atovicone is rather expensive. <clears throat> Surveillance studies carried out in Massachusetts some time ago indicated that co-infection with Lyme and babesiosis is quite common. Um, 
in acute Lyme disease, in, in samples that were being processed for acute Lyme disease, 6.3% uh, were found to be positive for Babesia by PCR. Um, that's, that's, a, that's actually a huge number and it, it's, it's daunting. Um, Co-infection with anaplasmosis and babesiosis is also significantly frequent. And this has two important implications. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> the first is that for patients being treated for early Lyme disease with doxycycline, the mainstay, infection with anaplasmosis or Borrelia miyamotoi, another one we'll talk about later, will be eliminated. The second is that patients treated for Lyme disease who are at risk for complications of babesiosis, such as asplenia, cancer treatment, or other immunocompromised states, should be screened for babesiosis by PCR so they could be treated. To review the logic, and I, this, is, this is the important point that I want to leave you with, asplenic and immunocompromised hosts are at risk for serious complications of babesiosis. Therefore, test, avoid missing it. Doxycycline will not treat babesiosis, therefore empirical Lyme treatment isn't enough. And keep in mind that if you miss a case of anaplasmosis in an asymptomatic patient or a minimally asymptomatic patient, um, it's a self-limited disease, there's no chronic form of it, and Lyme treatment is effective for this anyway. <clears throat> when evaluating patients, don't forget to look everywhere. Um, I've been surprised many times. Uh, these, these two photos happen to be on the left, my son many years ago, and on the right, that's me. Uh, so you can be surprised where the ticks are. So when you're confronted with an obvious case of ECM, should you be ordering a lab test? Well, <clears throat> recognition of erythema chronic migraines is a clinical diagnosis of early Lyme disease. Um, <clears throat> for the patient with early Lyme and risk factors for babesiosis, testing for babesiosis by PCR is indicated before, because of the risk of silent co-infection. Lyme serology is not useful in early Lyme, but it is confirmatory and necessary for more advanced Lyme diagnoses when they're suspected. Also, once positive, Lyme serology remains so. You can't look for seroreversion as a proof of cure. It's, it's very similar to the situation with syphilis, the treponemal antibodies remain positive indefinitely. And Lyme is caused by a, a spirochete, which is a cousin of syphilis. The corollary of this is that there is a second infection. If there's a second infection after being cured once, serology can't be used for diagnosis or management. And endemic regions, it's not uncommon to have multiple re-encounters with Lyme ticks, especially in, in people who work outside. <clears throat> At least seven distinct clinical syndromes are associated with Lyme borreliosis, and I'll discuss them further on. Um, this is just a summary slide. In the early syndrome, serology is not helpful. However, in the disseminated and late forms, positive serology is the rule. The early disseminated syndromes have other possible causes. So, Lyme has to be included in the differential. Lyme carditis usually presents with palpitations or syncope caused by first degree heart block. Fortunately, in most of these cases, only a temporary pacemaker is needed as the arrhythmia usually reverts with a course of intravenous ceftriaxone. While ECM is a clinical diagnosis, the approach to the patient with flu-like symptoms in the appropriate setting should include tick-borne infections in the differential diagnosis, 
Lyme serology is included here because even though it isn't a great screening test, only about 50% sensitivity, it may be helpful if positive since PCR for Lyme is relatively poor at only about 10% sensitivity. <clears throat> All tick-borne infections may present with an aseptic meningitis picture, but Lyme, Borrelia miyamotoi, as we'll discuss further, and anaplasma figure prominently here. Looking at the timeline of a hypothetical infection here, bacteremia in immunocompetent hosts is usually confined to a narrow window period preceding the induction of an antibody response. In Lyme disease, which may not even disseminate early, the presence of Borrelia in the blood occurs over a very narrow period. That is why PCR is not a great screening test for Lyme. In contrast for babesiosis, which is a bloodborne infection, the pathogen persists in the blood. Remember seeing the organisms in the red blood cells themselves. So PCR is great and it supersedes serology for diagnosis. Because of the narrowness of the PCR window in Lyme, in early disease, there is usually a window period during which neither PCR nor serology are positive. <clears throat> Lyme serology is examined using two types or tiers of techniques. There are several commercial first tier tests or ELISAs that are amenable to robotic screening, high throughput processing. However, as a first tier screening test, they're tweaked or designed to be very sensitive so that there will be false positives. Repeat, ELISAs or EIAs may be false positive and the number that may be reported, the actual data which is reported on the lab slips often, it's not informative. The IgM may appear before IgG, but IgM is more likely to be associated with false positives. Therefore, we need to use the Western blot or the immune, also known as the immunoblot for confirmation. And these tests are more complicated and have some degree of specificity. <clears throat> This shows the evolution of the antibody response over time by immunoblot or Western. Different antigens from the organism are separated in a laboratory on a gel and transferred to a membrane that is exposed to a standard dilution of the patient's serum. This way, the antibody response to individual borrelial antigens can be assessed, but only qualitatively. Different bands, correspond to different parts, parts of the organism. They have different significances. Note, for instance, the 41 kilodalton band here that is due to the protein found in the borrelial flagellum. Um, and you can see it's present at very early times here. This protein can actually cross-react with antibodies to the flagella of the spirochetes in our mouth accounting for some of the false positive elysis. Therefore, uh, a 41K band alone is not sufficient to make a diagnosis. There are variations between different reference strains in different labs. So standardization is a problem and scoring of immunoblots is a nuanced process. So the presence of a certain number of bands, depending on which laboratory is performing the test, determines whether it's positive or not, not the presence of any bands. And this is the official CDC recommendation for two-tiered testing. Because of the considerations we discussed, two-tiered testing is indicated to make a serological diagnosis. Note here that the CDC suggests a cutoff for early disease at 30 days. <clears throat> and this is just to reiterate the logic. The screening ELISA or EIA is highly sensitive, so it's good to rule out, but it lacks specificity, hence the need for a highly 
specific second tier. Over interpretation of first tier testing is common by providers in the field. This reiterates the message that negative immunoblock rules out seropositivity regardless of the first tier result. In some cases, as shown here, the IgM response can persist long after the early phase of infection, even following treatment. This does not indicate treatment failure. The common practice of repeating Lyme serology after treatment with persistent symptoms and retreating on the basis of elevated IgM is not correct. It's not consistent with the evidence uh, produced by studies. In the case of a suspected new infection after treatment or a suspected brand new infection, using the IgM response to diagnose is not correct. If positive, the Ig, if, if the infection is real and there's an IgM response, the I, IgG response will evolve in about three weeks unless treatment has intervened. Direct detection of Borrelia burgdorferi by culture is not of clinical utility. PCR is a direct technique that can be useful in cases of Lyme arthritis, as I'll discuss later. This is to reiterate that PCR is not a great screening tool for Lyme disease, although you'll find that it's marketed that way. <clears throat> Doxycycline is the mainstay of treatment. Keep in mind for your patients in densely endemic regions that and there's a tendency to keep a supply of doxycycline around in case one encounters tick bites. However, uh, old doxycycline is actually, is actually toxic. So you don't wanna keep a supply of doxycycline around. It's best to get a fresh batch. Also, while it's deemed safe for fetal and pediatric exposure, and this is a relatively recent, um, a relatively recent uh, change of heart, so to speak, uh, but it's the American Academy of Pediatrics uh, does endorse the use of doxycycline in children. Uh, if you're gonna treat, you should still check with the relevant obstetrician or pediatrician anyway, because they may have objections. Um, amoxicillin, uh, if you can get it these days, is an acceptable alternative. Um, late stages of Lyme disease are treated with prolonged courses of doxycycline or intravenous ceftriaxone, which is a, a big production because it involves placing a central line and treatment is usually three weeks. <clears throat> late Lyme disease is uncommon. Um, in the case of Lyme arthritis, which is really the syndrome that led to the discovery uh, of Lyme disease in the 70s. Um, it's, it's a rare disease, uh, and, and especially neur the neurologic disease, um, which is more rare than the arthri arthritis. But these late Lyme syndromes are invariably associated with positive serologies. Okay, um, and the most common neurologic presentation of uh, Lyme disease is actually Bell's palsy. <clears throat> Lyme arthritis is always associated with strong seropositivity, as I said, it usually affects the knee. There are objective findings, arthralgias, pain alone, do not support a diagnosis. There must be objective findings and joint fluid analysis is, is indicated to rule out crystal disease and other, other things. Um, but even though the organisms are sometimes found in the joint fluid, 
the PCR may not be positive. So it's, it's not a rule out test. So it can rule it in though. <clears throat> Neuroborreliosis is sometimes suspected in cases of patients with persistent symptoms after treatment for early Lyme disease. However, it is actually quite rare and diagnosis requires a formal neurological evaluation, imaging, and a CSF exam. The most common form of neuroborreliosis, which may appear in the late, or in the early disseminated form, is Bell's palsy. And Bell's palsy in New England should be worked up for Lyme disease in all cases. Subtle findings, however, on form, uh, subtle neuropsychiatric symptoms um, may or may not be due to neuroborreliosis, but um, in order to work it up, you really need a formal neuropsychiatric evaluation. Subjective complaints should not trigger treatment. However, uh, the good news is that documented neuroborreliosis usually responds to a course of IV ceftriaxone. This is to reiterate the role of serology in the approach to suspected late Lyme disease. I get a lot of questions about this. Changes in titers are of no proven sign clinical significance. Serial testing is not useful once a diagnosis is made. You cannot use it to monitor treatment. A significant fraction of patients treated for early Lyme disease have persistent subjective symptoms. Actual treatment failures with persistent infection are not well documented, nor is antibiotic resistance. Post Lyme disease syndrome is defined by the CDC. It's been studied and controlled studies show no benefit for repeated cycles of treatment. <clears throat> the term chronic Lyme disease is actually a misnomer. It's used to label patients with medically unexplained symptoms. It does not name a disease that is recognized by evidence-based medicine. However, a huge amount of false information containing this term is found on the internet, and it's promulgated by non-evidence-based providers. So if someone, one of your patients presents with a complaint of chronic Lyme disease, it means that they've been in contact with a non-evidence-based provider and you have to proceed with caution. I recommend um, the article by Hank, first author Hank Fader in the New England Journal way back in 2007 about chronic Lyme disease. Um, they identified four categories. <clears throat> Each situation provides, presents a, a challenge to the provider. Um, in the first category, um, symptoms of unknown cause with no, no evidence of Lyme disease. Category two, another disease, another diagnosis. Category three, symptoms of unknown cause, but with either confirmed or questionable serology for Lyme disease, but no other objective clinical findings. And fourth, um, many cases of post-Lyme disease syndrome are labeled as chronic Lyme disease, and they're not. Most patients who present to evidence-based providers with a label of chronic Lyme disease have been labeled by non-evidence-based providers. Some of these non-evidence providers, non-evidence-based providers call themselves Lyme literate. And it's, it, that's a code word. 
Some subject their patients to an astounding array of non-evidence-based treatments, which are some of which are listed here. And <clears throat> some patients also have missed diagnoses of other problems that might account for their symptoms. For those interested, I recommend uh, the Quack Watch uh, and Lyme Science websites for illumination. I think the Lyme Science website is a little better. It's kept more up to date and it names names. It names, actually names uh, some of the non-evidence-based providers, um, many of whom have had their medical license revoked or act, disciplinary actions have been taken. To get a vivid idea of the cultural anthropology of this problem, um, you can view these polemic films under our skin and under our skin too. They're on Netflix and elsewhere, and um, they're really chilling. <clears throat> Shifting over to anaplasmosis, um, which is due to infection by the rickettsial organism known as anaplasma phagocytophilum. It was formerly known as human granulocytic ehrlichiosis, but it's confusing because it's distinct from human monocytic ehrlichiosis caused by a different organism called Ehrlichia chaffinsis, which is transmitted by the Lone Star and dog ticks. So anaplasmosis, the one prevalent in New England, is transmitted by deer ticks, and it's characterized by fever, other constitutional symptoms and usually involves leukopenia, thrombocytopenia, and LFT abnormalities not seen in Lyme disease. And it shows that little purple dot on the periphery of the white blood cell is called a morula. And that's actually the anaplasma organism that can be found on smear. The good news is that anaplasmosis responds well to doxycycline and there's no chronic form. So if a mildly symptomatic patient recovers without treatment, no further intervention is necessary. <clears throat> Diagnosis by PCR is the way to go. It's very sensitive. And the treatment is uh, relatively straightforward. When the other form of ehrlichiosis is suspected, PCR testing is indicated. Uh, doxycycline is the treatment. In this case, the um, morula is found in the monocytes, not in the granulocytes. Shifting over to Borrelia miyamotoi, uh, this is a relatively recently described disease. Um, infection by a cousin of Borrelia burgdorferi, it's also transmitted by the deer tick. And um, one of the first descriptions of this disease was uh, actually authored by um, my MAVEN project colleague, Dr. Hanumara Chowdhury, shown here in uh, the Annals of Internal Medicine, their 2013 article. Uh, this shows the family tree of the Borrelia. Uh, Borrelia miyamotoi is also a relative of the Borrelia causing tick-borne relapsing fever, a rare disease found mainly in the West, transmitted by soft-bodied ticks, not the deer tick. Borrelia miyamotoi is far less prevalent than anaplasmosis. For now, we don't know how that's going to change. When to suspect it, the clinical features of this infection are a predominance of an aseptic meningitis picture with elevated serum transaminases, but usually without any cytopenias, unlike anaplasmosis. Since this is a relapsing fever type of pathogen, its presence in the blood is prolonged, allowing detection by PCR. Serology is not useful clinically. <clears throat> Oops. The current diagnostic paradigm in suspected Miyamotoi infection involves a two-stage PCR process. 
The sample is sent for PCR with broad range Borrelia primers that will detect any form of Borrelia. And if any are positive, then species specific primers are used to distinguish Borrelia burgdorferi from Miyamotoi. So in acute or suspected acute tick-borne illness, as you can see here, our most useful diagnostic tests involve PCR. The exception is in early Lyme where PCR has low sensitivity and serology has only about 50% sensitivity. So it relies strongly on clinical diagnosis or clinical suspicion. Now, um, here I've enumerated some scenarios involving tick-borne disease that I've encountered in ID consultation. In other words, these are the questions that people have sent me. Uh, I've touched on many of them. They're listed here for review. Uh, I may go back to them if there's time at the end of this talk. <clears throat> um, some progress has been made in the vaccine field recently in highly endemic regions. We have a reason to want a Lyme vaccine. Exactly how we're gonna apply it, it's not clear, but um, along more than 20 years ago, the first vaccine uh, was introduced. It, it's effective, but it was withdrawn. Um, there were unfounded fears and rumors spread that um, it actually provoked a form of arthritis and there was some very complicated um, hypothesizing about what was going on scientifically. It was an interesting time. Unfortunately, uh, the company withdrew the uh, vaccine because they didn't want the, um, the uh, legal exposure. Uh, however, the current vaccine that's in clinical trials um, seems promising. Uh, it'll remain to be seen how we'll implement it. Uh, but you, you know, stay tuned. It's a Pfizer vaccine. It's not an mRNA vaccine. Um, and it's, it, the engineering is very interesting. Um, and I hope it's gonna be introduced soon and I, I would probably uh, wanna get it uh, because um, exposure to Lyme disease does not confer immunity. So even if you live in an endemic region and you've had the, had the disease, you still might be interested in getting the vaccine. The mRNA technology, which has been so useful for COVID, um, seems promising uh, in that it can incorporate a mixture of antigens. So there's a lot of uh, investigation going on in this area, but the development is only in the very early stages. So, um, <clears throat> We need to educate our <clears throat> clientele about avoidance of tick bites, which is really involves common sense. You know, um, if you go hiking, uh, tuck your pants into your socks, wear white socks. You can spray with permethrins or DEET and uh, that will help. Uh, you really have to avoid tick bites if possible. Um, and most residents of endemic regions become accustomed to this. However, um, to augment this, uh, especially for people who are at high risk, there's a prospect for regular infusions of monoclonal antibodies, similar to what's being proposed for COVID, that protect against infection. And this has been developed by UMass Biologics. Um, and this may be a good way of, uh, affecting pre-exposure prophylaxis. Lastly, uh, and this is, this is kind of neat, it's been proposed at least for Nantucket uh, to release mice genetically engineered to be resistant to carriage of Lyme disease that would outcompete the susceptible mice. This has been in the newspaper. Um, what could possibly go wrong? So, um, that's, that's my talk. Uh, you feel free to contact me uh, directly for questions anytime through the Maven platform. Uh, I'm always happy to discuss cases or questions that you have.
Um, and I, I would open it up to questions now. I think you know, we have plenty of time. Thank you, Dr. Dorsky. That was great. And you ended right on time. We have about 15 minutes for questions. Um, if you want to stop sharing your screen, that's fine. Um, we already have one question in the chat, and I'm going to encourage everyone on the call, if you have a question, feel free to either type it in the Q&A box or in the chat box below, or you can go ahead and hit the raise your hand feature if you prefer to dialogue with Dr. Dorsky and ask him some questions about um, his talk today. So Dr. Dorsky, the first question that I have for you is, um, in an endemic area for Lyme, what is the risk of infection per tick bite? And this provider says, I work as a camp doc and campers who find a tick or an indicative mark often ask about their risk of getting Lyme disease after such an exposure. Yes, uh, this is, this is a, a good and important question. And I apologize for leaving this out of my talk. I touched on it in half a sentence and I really should have had a separate slide for this. So, um, the carriage of pathogens by ticks varies a lot from area to area. Uh, in some areas of New England, less than 1% of the ticks carry the organism. And in some areas, 50% of the ticks carry the organism. So your chances of getting it from a given tick bite vary a lot, and it's almost impossible to know. Um, 20 years ago, uh, we would we actually in I, when I was practicing in Connecticut we would ask people to bring their ticks in bring in the tick that bit you and we'll subject it to PCR and if it's positive we'll treat you and if it's negative we won't treat you um, and we had a the agricultural station for the state of Connecticut would actually run the PCRs we don't do that anymore um, what we recommend is simply um, if if there's a concern, if the tick is fed, and uh, I think I mentioned that it takes, the tick has to crawl around on you for about a day before it feeds. And uh, this is, you know, a, a tick crawling on you does not constitute a tick bite. But um, if you pull a tick off of you, that's been there for a while, then there's a question. But even after it started feeding, um, the tick doesn't transmit Lyme disease until at, over 24 hours after it's fed, after it started feeding. So the risk of any, for any given tick bite is still low. However, um, we recommend, and I, I think up to date recommends, and pretty much everyone recommends taking one dose of 200 milligrams of doxycycline for a tick, a confirmed tick bite. Uh, I, I do that. I recommend that to my family and friends. Um, it's a little bit of an overkill, but doxycycline is uh, cheap and, well, relatively cheap, depends on where you get it. And it's very well tolerated. Uh, the only risk is that in the summer, you don't want to uh, be out in the bright sun because uh, you can get photosensitization from doxycycline. So um, uh, thanks for that question. So I, I do I do prophylax for uh, tick bites with one dose of 200 milligrams of doxycycline. And Dr. Dorsky, just some additional context from that um, provider that asked the question. They said they're actually in Northern California and their camp that they work at is um, in the Lake Tahoe area. So I don't know if you know offhand any specific you know, recommendations about um, Lyme prevalence there, but I just wanted to provide you that in, info as well. Yeah, I, I don't know about North North Shore of Tahoe, um, uh, but I and w where I would check if I I, I could check now, but um, I'd, I'd go to the California Department of Public Health because a Lyme disease is prevalent in California, all over California. So, it, um, well, or is that Nevada, no, North Shore? But anyway. <laughs> Tahoe the area. Geography skills on that. Yeah, yeah. I, I, forget. Um, I know South. I know South Shore is is California, at least part. But anyway, and I'm sure that data does exist online. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. And the follow up question again from that provider is just how much, if known, will the 200 milligram dose of doxy reduce the risk um, after the tick bite for yeah. Lyme disease? I, I don't know. I don't know if anybody really knows because um, I'm not aware of any reliable controlled trials. And, um, you know, in, in a lot of cases, um, 
the people we end up treating are not people who are at real risk. We're, we're treating our, our uh, psychology in many cases. Um, um, be, you know, it, it's a legitimate concern. I mean, you can get quite ill from tick-borne diseases. And if you, if you find a tick on you, as, as I, I found many ticks on me, I live in a, a, a tick sanctuary, practically. Um, it, it's unnerving. So I can understand wanting to take doxycycline. It's reasonable. We have a follow-up question as well. Um, so this is a question from a provider that states that some providers do not want to give a prescription for doxycycline unless the tick is actually engorged. So they're looking for your thoughts on the prescription for the tick, if there is a tick bite, um, but the tick is not engorged. Well, you know, I, I think that if you, if you want to be scientifically accurate, um, ticks don't transmit Lyme disease until more than 24 hours after they've begun feeding. So if you're not removing an engorged tick from you, uh, your risk of Lyme disease is acquisition is really low. However, um, we don't know uh, what is true for anaplasmosis or babesiosis. Very good feeding studies have been done in laboratories on mice. And that's why we, we know that the organism is not transmitted until after the end of feeding for Lyme disease. But we don't know this for babesiosis and we don't know this for Miyamotoi and we don't know this for anaplasmosis. So, um, you know, I, I think that um, it, 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 there, there's somewhat of a gap in scientific knowledge here. And so I tend to err on the side of being a sieve, just giving anybody who wants it doxycycline um, because it's one dose and um, the risk of harm is extremely low. Great, thank you. Um, so I think that was our last question that we have in the Q&A box. So I guess I'll do a last call for any questions from our <clears throat> attendees. Um, again, feel free to raise your hand if you wanna ask it verbally or type it in the chat box. Um, and I will do one last mini advertisement to let everyone know that Dr. Dorsky is available for e-consults on our Maven Project platform. So you can go to our clinic portal. Um, if you go to mavenproject.org in the top right-hand corner, click on our clinic portal, you can access our e-consult platform. You can view any of our upcoming medical education sessions that we are hosting. You can reach out to Dr. Dorsky directly if you think of a question later after this session's ended and you can ask him it over our VC platform. Um, it doesn't look like we have any additional questions so, Dr. Dorsky, I'll turn it over to you for any last words. Uh, well, if um, if you want to go over that that uh, slide with all the pitfalls in in management that I listed, and if you have any um, questions or arguments about them, uh, feel free to contact me. I'd love to uh, get information from first line providers about uh, how they're approaching this problem and uh, you know what they're thinking. So thanks for listening. Yeah, I'll include that in the follow-up email as well and encourage people to reach out if they have additional questions. So thank you again, Dr. Dorsky. We appreciate you as always. And thank you everyone that tuned in today. And uh, you'll be seeing a post-education um, session survey that will pop up shortly. So please complete that. And we'll be sending out the slides and the recording to you um, in the next few days. So thank you again, everyone, and have a lovely day.